thank you for whoever just let me know. I forgot to turn on my microphone. All right, let's see what I was talking about. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. I saw yours first. Oh, and then Betty and then Diane57. Everybody was like, oh, Laura, I can't hear you. Okay, you can hear me now, I hope. So I'm sorry about that. What I was talking about is I saw that, um, boy, that is irritating. Yeah, isn't that irritating when I'm talking and you can't hear anything I'm saying? So, yay. Thank you, Laura, for helping me out there. I appreciate that very much. Thank you to everybody. Okay, let me quickly go back to what I was talking about. Next Saturday is the Jitsi Sit and Sew. An all day sit and sew, come and go when you wish. And um, if you're a member of our group, there'll be instructions on the group for you to find to get on the Jitsi. And it's very easy and enjoyable. And you all get to chat. You don't have to type. You can just sit and chat. And uh, you can you work on your sewing projects by hand or machine and just visit. And that's awfully nice because this past year, it has been tough to get out and visit. Other thing I was saying was I saw that Polly asked a question about using invisible thread and um, it leaving holes from the needle while she was sewing it. Very common. And you got really good advice about taking a little water, maybe a very clean toothbrush and trying to kind of, or your finger and trying to get the holes to look less noticeable. Um but use a small, a finer needle. But if you find that the invisible thread breaks too much, you might just have to live with the holes. And like Alex Anderson, like Alex Anderson said, if you can't see it from the back of a galloping horse, don't worry about it. So Anyway, no, the sound, uh, so anyway, don't worry, and um, it's part of it, and you've got great advice, use a, a thinner needle, and then after that, don't worry about it, because anybody who's actually a sewer will see it and go, I, I get the same thing. <laughs> That's one of the nice things you'll learn. The longer you're a quilter, the more the ladies will share and say, oh, I have the same problem. So it's really nice to be part of a group, and we are good. Um, we are a good community. We are family here. So, hello, hello, hello. It's half day. Okay, good. I wasn't sure, but uh, that's what I was going to tell you. Is I can't often be at those kind of things as much as I would love to. I spend at least twenty one. 21, 20 hours a week to do the Thursday night show, to do the Sunday show, and maybe more, depending on how much I, I, I work on it. And like, like I've been working the last two days straight, just getting ready to do this show. So as much as I would like to, what I'm being very careful of is not burning out. I've been doing this for three years now, and I love it. This really works for me. And um, I have to be able to balance my life and still feel like I give you enough information and inspiration to be worth your time. So I might not make it to the, the sew and sit, sit and sews, pardon me, but please know that I'm so tickled you're doing it, and I support you very much. Now, let's see. Deborah said, first day with that. Oh, that's wonderful. No extended neck movement. Oh, no looking down. We're sorry, Deborah, but I tell you what, the time spent healing right is so important. It was so hard for me not lifting anything after my surgery. I couldn't lift anything for two months. And that's frustrating because you want to just do things and then you stop and go, oh, I can't do that. But it's worth it when you heal properly and you're doing good. So hang in there, darling. 
I am so happy that you're feeling at least some relief and we'll keep hoping. You know, I, I heard someone say on a TV show last night that the time will pass so quickly. It's been five months since my surgery. Like, it passed in almost a blink. So understand you can handle anything for a few weeks. So we're rooting for you, Miss Deborah. And we're so happy that you got that surgery done. That is so, so important. You see little Maisie walking around. And do you see who else came to join us today? Kiwi. Hi. There she is. So Kiwi came to join us. Um, yesterday, I couldn't bring her down before now because she um, hadn't had her wings clipped. And she would be getting into trouble if not. So yesterday, Mark and I, I did, I, he did, he clipped her wings while I held her. And then he held her and I clipped her toenails. And sadly, a couple of them bled. She, Finny, our, our cockatiel, he was so easy to do. He just, you turn him over and he's like, okay, whatever. She, when we turned her over and I went to touch her foot, she clenched it. And it's so hard to try to pull the little toe up and to get it trimmed. So oh, it was tough. But Kiwi, you want to come say hi? Huh? You want to come say hi? So she, you can see she barely has any blue feathers, and that's her flight feathers. And Kiwi, Kiwi, want to dance? Want to dance? Let me see. I'm going to do up, be downy, up, be downy. Huh? Up, be downy. Uh, there we go. Got a little bit of head action. But she's like, what are you doing? So anyway, but I needed to get her wings done because I haven't been spending as much time with her as I should. I should spend time every day with her. But with her wanting to fly, it was like, well, you know, we'll see. But here, you let's go back here. No, don't bite me. Ready? Step up. Don't bite me. Step up. Now, I know you don't want to get it off, Mama. But yesterday, when I was trying to do her nails, she bit this finger pad so badly. That thing hurt all evening. So anyway, but she was scared. She didn't know. So anyway, you should try to do Augie Bear's feet. Oh. But I luckily I had the styptic powder right there with me. But I felt terrible, and she was it, it didn't feel good. She held it up for a little bit, but now she's like no problem. But anyway, so it is so good to see all of you, and I've been working like I said for the last couple of days trying to get things ready. A couple little things real quickly. So I told you about next Saturday, March twentieth, which is National Quilting Day. Um, the sit and sew. So I might try to pop in and say hi. We'll see. But um, I just found this in an old magazine. And Quilt Almanac. And somebody must have given it to me because I don't remember subscribing to a Quilt Almanac. And I wish I could figure out what year. I The pages are pretty yellow. But I don't think there's a date on it. But it was one, it was interesting because it was showing you what you can do with half square triangles. And as you see, if you just made a, a whole bunch of half square triangles, look at all the quilts you could make. And now with the modern quilt movement, I have a feeling there's a whole lot more that you could come up with. And I just glanced and saw Marcia said March 20th is also the first day of spring. And it's also my little grandson, Russell. It's his second birthday. And I'm always touched because he was born, naturally born, on my father's birthday. My father's been gone now. It'll be 11 years tomorrow. But how nice that little Russell shares his birthday. So that's very, very nice. Yes, great idea, Kathleen Ziegler. Kathleen Ziegler, it is a great way to use scraps. Now, I'm a person who has a little trouble using scraps, and I have to apologize. 
but I've seen you, you used to see on Alex Anderson's um, show and different things that people would take and put all the pieces in a brown paper bag, and whatever piece you drew out, you had to sew to whatever piece you were working on. I can't do that. I have a little too much of a control issue in me. And uh, so that's a hard thing for a dev to do. Oh, I will definitely tell him. I'm so excited. So anyway, but scrap quilts don't come easily to me. I admire people like Bonnie Hunter. And she has made her whole career around scrap quilts. So I really admire her, but it, scrap quilting is not my kind of thing. There is Miss Michelle. How are you? Yes. Yeah, so, so next Saturday, 930 Eastern time. And um, you, and that's New York time. Y'all figure it out where you live. But then I got this in the mail yesterday and I thought, you know, I love there's, I, I get maybe two magazines anymore, maybe three at the outside. And I used to get a lot. And being a president of a guild, I founded the guild for nine years. I felt like, you know, that was important for me to keep up with what's going on. But now it's like I have a stack of them I haven't read that date back for years. But there, is, there are a couple I still like. McCall's Quilting, I like. And um, Quilter's not the newsletter, that one went out, but there's another one that I like, but my very favorite quilt magazine of all is Quilting Arts Quilt Magazine, and, you know, could it be, because now I love making art quilts, but I just love the quality of this magazine. I love the photos in it, and it just inspires me. It inspires me to create. And I just, I absolutely adore it. I love the accompanying show that comes on your PBS station. But this, when I get this magazine, I can't wait. And I read it from cover to cover. I also do something that you might find um, helpful. The worst thing I can do is read a magazine and just put it in a pile and keep it because then I'll never go through it again. So what I do is I cannibalize this magazine. And what I'll do is I'll go through and if I see a project or a skill that I want to try, then I'll pull that out. I'll tear it right out of the magazine. And I have a way of folding things. If I fold the page upright in half, that means that's a pattern that I would like to make. If I fold it in half the wide way, then that's a technique or skill that I want to share with you or practice on my, for myself. And I used to try to save everything. And I had a huge box full of stuff I'd ripped out. I finally went through it, said, you know, in fact, I, I, I used to think I wanted to keep big binders of every pattern, every idea. Well, that's too much work. And I just didn't, I didn't refer to it like I thought I would. But so now I know just pick out what I really, really want to make. Not something that maybe but something I really, really want to make. And, um, but like this has an article about texture and it's just fabulous. I mean, you know, this is my year wanting to do embellishments. Well, look at the ideas you get from this magazine. So some, and sometimes I'll find a small picture that would really look pretty in a necklace. And, you know, I make the, I use the little cabochon, glass cabochons, and I'll put a picture under the glass and then make it into a necklace. So I look for things like that. The covers usually are wonderful for making paper beads. And then 
um, I save the article. If it's something that, you know, because I'll read it and that might be enough just to have read it. But then there are things like, ooh, I need to remember this. And so I will tear that out, fold it in half the wide way so that I know that's a skill I want to try. And by doing that and then throwing the rest of the magazine out, by doing that, I really make the best use of it for me. Because I know that if I read all of this and then I put it on a shelf, I'll never look through it again. And I'll end up missing the great parts in here that I need. So I just thought, I saw it. It got me excited. It made me happy. And I thought, I want to, I want to share that with y'all. Okay. So let me see. Oh, I didn't even work on the Bargello this week. So I'll show you the completion of the Bargello next week. But I did work on something very good. Oh, let me tell you, this quilt journal, this is working out wonderfully. I listed a few more. I found these pages on the internet, and they're free printables. And so I printed them out, and now I'm up to 64 projects that I'm uh, um, UF. I'm up to 64. And then soon as I can catch my breath, I've got some weekly schedules and then I've got a project sheet for each one. And that's kind of nice because instead of pulling out all of your quilts, you can look through the pages and go, yeah, that's one I want to focus on. So I really appreciate this. And this was a cheap, um, it was a giveaway binder for Husqvarna Viking sewing machines from a rep. She put it on a table and I grabbed it and I covered it with a happy fabric, a fabric that I knew would really make me excited about picking it up and putting the record in. So that's been a really good thing. Oh, I know, here we go. So here I found the paperwork on my computer for the Storm at Sea class that I took that I have an unfinished object. So I've been trying to, when I see something or directions that I didn't put with the project, I print it out real quickly. And that's, I fold it long and tall because that means it's a pattern. Automatically tells me by the fold what it is. All right. So now I'm really excited to show you something. So, all right, here we go. I'm very very, whoops, oh, ha, I said, I think this quilt's falling apart. I had two quilts at once, <laughs> but this is what I worked on Friday and Saturday, and I have it most of the way done. So here is, for my Katie girl, here is her cow. What I have left to do is to use my mono, mono poly thread, my visible thread, and stitch over. Just do zigzags all over and make sure that all of the threads are fully anchored down. And then after that, after it's fully anchored down, then I will do thread painting. And I will add some little whiskers, some little tufts of hair on the ears. Now, the things that I liked that I did was to fussy cut this little frond out of a fabric that mimics the little hair, tuft of hair that flops over on the ear. So I like that. I also like the way I made the ear tag look like it was an actual fastener on the ear. As I told you too, you like the flower? Oh, it is a mandala. I got, whoops, let me make sure I can get it on the camera. There we go. 
it's a mandala print that I bought. And it was a fabric that had these uh, different kinds of these all over it. And I picked the one I liked most and put it right in the center. And I noticed that cows have this whirl of hair. It's like all of the hair com comes together. So they end up with this whirl right on W-H-O-R-L, right on their forehead. And I noticed she had put a flower there. So then I said, well, I'm going to make the little bits around it like a sunflower and have the mandala as the center. So, and the yellow eyelashes, yes, because we were supposed to use, pick a color scheme. I used a complementary or almost a split complementary and did this. Now, the cow in the photo, I realized this later, the cow in the photo was one of the white-faced Hertford breeds. And so when she did hers, let me see if I can show you the pattern that I used. When she did hers, she used her light color for the face. See, it was a Hertford. And, um, and then the other color for the body. And I realized I didn't really follow that rule. But I'm not worried because I didn't have enough yellows. To, to make up the entire face and still give the quality I wanted. So mine's just, it's going to be, mine could be a black Angus. Mine could be all kinds of things. But anyway, I'm just really happy with it. And like I told you before, I changed a lot on it. I, as I worked on one part, it made me want to fix something on the other. So a cowlick, yeah, yeah. I would like one of those where all the hair kind of starts from there and grows out in different directions. So I did it Deb's way. I like that, Kathleen Ziegler. One thing I think I might have to do is do a little more definition, whoops, on this ear. Because I noticed when I took a photo of it yesterday that the ear was less defined. So I'm going to make sure to do that. But... So I'll take an invisible thread and I'll zigzag all over it because I put a lot of little pieces. Hers was larger pieces, but I just wanted extra pieces. And I really wanted to kind of give you a feel of the fur um, of the cow. Then I'll do the thread painting to do any little whiskers, look, make sure to define the eyelashes, to do the ear hair, and around the edge where the, the cow fur kind of sticks out but I, I'm really I have to tell you I'm very happy with it now I found I said that I wanted to use a background thank you I wanted to use a background that was a little calmer so that the cow really popped out and so I kind of looked around my fabrics and I said well I want something that replicates the blue sky because, see the blue in his eye? I wanted to bounce that color back out. And then I found this green batik, and it has purple in it, and then it has his blue eye color. So I hope you agree with what I chose. Then I also kind of did something different, which is add this fabric right there. And what that fabric is... That fabric is a nod to the farm buildings because my daughters were in 4-H and they, they loved the county fair time and they loved showing their sheep and goats. And so I wanted to pick up the, the barn color, which was a whitish gray, and add that in. And I think it just gives you a little bit of a break between the intensity of the blue and the green. So I'm really happy with it. I'll, I told my Katie that, you know, when I start stuff now, I finish it because I've got to. You know, I don't want one more project added to the list. So, but I really am very, very happy with this. And I think it came out really well. All right, so I'll put this over here. The other thing is I want to promote our Thursday I want to promote our Thursday art quilt sessions. And it's 7.30 p.m. every Thursday night. 
and we will pick, I like getting your opinion, and we will pick a different subject matter, and um, I'll give you some ideas of things we might want to try, but it's to, um, thank you, Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl's here, and, um, but I, I try to look for a project that will develop all of our skills, mine included. Now, I had a few things to do to this. I had to do define the snow on the mountain a little better. It may be a little too much, I'm not sure, but then my water looked too humpy. So I had to try to kind of flatten the top a little more. I've had a little trouble this time doing this little lake because trying to make it look like it wasn't floating and then trying to make sure it didn't look too humpy. Then I, the other day, I said, I saw, a, I don't know where this picture came from, but I saw a picture and it had a stone wall in it. And I went, oh, a stone wall. That would be really cool. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Now, one thing I've got to see, do this is supposed to be a hill coming into this valley, but I kind of followed the fabric line because it looked right. So I might take it off and make it come down. I'm not sure. But, um, and then I was trying so hard not to have everything in the middle. And, you know, I've got the cabin and the tree over here, and I'm going to have a swing off the tree over here. But this lake kind of came out in the middle. Then the wall it started to look like it was going to come back out and open in the middle. And I'm trying to avoid that. So I cut this side back a little more. I also found some fabric with a little bit of pink on it. So I added that like a wildflower along one of the planes. And then I added some green fabric right in front of the wall to kind of look like a grass or something that kind of, it just helps the junction of the wall and the pasture, the field, the meadow. So anyway, but I think I like it better with the wall in there. And so now I'll just kind of see how it goes. I tend to want to put the same things in my quilt. So I have to be kind of careful that they don't start looking alike. Now, today I had someone last week ask, where is your landscape quilt that had the sheep in it? And that's up in this corner right there. And then here's one of the, I did a landscape with trees kind of up close and that had a lake in it. And then, in fact, the lamb one had a little creek running through. I love water and so I usually try to put it in just about every quilt I make. Then this one is something I did, I think, I haven't quite finished it, but I think it's a quilt that I did before I started this show. And I, ha I need to go ahead and finish it because I think it's got some, <laughs> pardon me for the hiccup, I, I think it's got some really good things in it. I love the fencing. I love the way I did the driveway and the, the curve. I love this little creek kind of coming down here over the rocks and I, I love the barn I need to work on it right now I tried to color block the shadows on the barn but I need to you know it's just like I told you every one of these quilts will reach a stage where they're so awkward and you just you know Okay, how did I do the wall? There's several different ways you can do it. This, I had the print. Okay? But, it's how you handle the print. Hold on one second, guys. All right. Like I told you, when I, I love going to quilt shows because I'll go to vendors. And I love it when a vendor has... Fat quarters of landscape things, like trees and grass and all of that. So I had, quickly I found this stone wall fabric. And then I found this stone wall fabric. 
while it was pretty easy to see that this would be the more rustic and look farther away. This is better for close up. And I used this in the wall down here. I used some green um, kind of ivy wall and then that because you're a little closer to coming down the drive to get to the barn. But this, I thought, since it's smaller, would be better for... Um, be better for this landscape because it's going to be a little farther away and you're not going to see oh thank you diane hon you're not going to see it as good remember we've still got all kinds of flowers and stuff to put in front of it so it's kind of a peekaboo effect which is which is really good and with landscapes you always start at the top and work your way down you also start at the item farther away and work closer to you the, you finish up with the things that are the closest to you in that landscape. So the wall had to go in now because then we start, when I start doing thread painting and hand embroidery, you know, that has to already be there. But what I did, see how it goes up a curve? I didn't just want to cut a section of the wall in a curve, in a swath, because I wanted, the, I wanted it to look more realistic. So what I did is as I would get to a point where it would take another curve, I would cut it, then cut a small piece and put in, trying to go up the curve but keep the blocks as level as I could. So it took some angle. Hi, Miss Cheryl. Oh, you don't worry, Cheryl. Friends are too important. Real life gets in the way, and that's the way it should be. But if you'll notice, I did a lot of cutting and piecing to try to make the wall look a little more realistic. And since I've got to sew it down with invisible thread, it doesn't matter how many pieces that I want. But I didn't want to just cut a curvy line on the, on the fabric because then it wouldn't look right. So I, I, I cut... A straight piece and what I did too is I took care to find to find a strip that has kind of a straight line. Let me show you. Okay, you see all this. I mean this is up and down and craggy. Well what I did is I went to this line right here. Look how straight that line is. Isn't that cool how they do that? That and so I cut it along that line. That gave me something to start with, and then I decided about how tall I wanted it. I didn't worry about getting the stone straight on the bottom because I knew I would have grassy weeds, you know, glued in front to kind of, because you know, animals don't get it picked clean, and if somebody took the big lawnmower out there, you can't get up against a, brick, a stone wall. Oh, no worry, no worry, but... um. But anyway, I did add a stone wall down there. I think that's pretty much, but I love adding fences. That all gives you a sense of depth. So, but then what I did is I wanted to have an opening in the fence. And I wanted the, fen the stone wall, the stone wall, pardon me, not fence, but it did act as a fence. I wanted to give it some age. So what I did is see how I kind of cut it back? as if something had kind of knocked part of it down and it had been ignored for years. And I haven't decided, but I might cut, try to cut some individual stones and kind of lean them on it or lay them in the grass as if they fell and that's where they stayed. So, but that's what this is supposed to look like. And I tried to make sure it wasn't too matchy-matchy. So I cut the stone differently. I hope you can see both sides of that. So, but that was pretty easy because it's just kind of follow the line. But that's the fun of having a stash. It takes time to develop a stash for landscaping. It was the purple cow knocking it. Oh, <laughs> you're wrong. Oh, that is good, Kathleen. You are on today. So anyway, I'm going to go back to Cheryl since she just came. I've got to show off my purple cow. 
So, because I've gotten it now, the cow itself is done. I've got it on the background. Then I'll take thread and do, uh, I'll take some mono, uh, mono filament, polyester mono filament. And I will zigzag all over it so I can stabilize all the small pieces. Oh, and I should tell you how I did the curves. Okay. See the back? And it was easy as pie. All right. What I did. I'll show you. Because I almost forgot. This is a perfect teaching moment. Because it gives more interest without being too busy. And it was so easy. So you take a piece of fabric like this. And then you take your other piece of fabric. Now picture that these are bigger pieces of fabric, of course. All right. So now I take, and I want them like this. And I want them curvy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oops, now come on, Deb. How did I think of, no. I, I, I started to do this and then do the curve, but you don't. You overlap them, okay? Overlap them. Now, let me get something real quick here. Because you won't believe how easy it was to do. Okay, let me, so I don't waste much fabric. Let me move back here, because I save all my scraps. You know, ladies. All right, I've overlapped them how much I need to do to do my curve. And then, nah. then I'll come in here with a chalk marker or some chalk. I love these Taylor's chalks. Clover makes some, and they're only like $2 a piece, and they last forever. But, okay, so I've overlapped. You see this overlap? And you only overlap it the distance that you, the width you want the curve to be. So then you take, and you take your chalk, and you decide how you want that curve to look. And it's better if you kind of do it nice and relaxed like that, okay? And... Oh, and I think I forgot to show you all these, too. So let me leave this out. All right. Oh, birdie, hush, hush. All right. Now it's overlapped. I've drawn the curve that I want on it. What I do is I come in here with my rotary cutter. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Got to put my glove on. I come in here, and this is good to have a glove because you're going to be kind of holding it pretty close. And I follow the curve. I don't have to be perfect, but just kind of follow it. Follow the curve down, okay? And try to remember that it's tempting. It's tempting to want to put right sides together because we're so used to doing that. But you don't. You overlap it the way it's going to be with the pretty side of both fabrics facing up. Overlap just enough to give you the amount of, gen of gentle curve. I needed it to overlap by that much. Okay? Now, then you'll notice, wow, look. That fits perfectly together. Whoops. That fits perfectly together. Okay? But watch what happens. You can't sew it that way. I guess you could do a zigzag. But what you do, you have to turn it. Now you turn it right sides together. And you match the curves. And then you come here and you pin... You pin the curve. Whoops. I'm trying to pin my gloves. You pin the curve. 
and you and you don't pin all of it. You just pin the beginning and the end. Okay. You pin the beginning and the end. And if you want, you could always pin about halfway, which would probably be about this. But what you do then is this fabric is heavier on the bottom, so I'll have that on the bottom. And you just start sewing, and you just gently, as you go, kind of ease in, putting this, obviously, this sticks up where the other goes down. That's what it's like. That's okay. You just gently pull it into line and stitch and stitch and stitch, gently pulling it into line, stitch and stitch until you're done. And then look how easy this was. And then I just pressed whichever way I thought it really seemed to want to go. And I could clip the edges, but it really didn't even need that. But I just gently stitched, and it look how it went together. Isn't that neat? So I did these two first. Then I did those two, and it worked beautifully, and then that way it gives you an interesting background without being too difficult. And over here, see, it just kind of comes up and down. So it's just that easy. You lay them right sides up. You overlap them the amount of the curve that you want. You draw it the curve you want, then you cut it, and then when you put them right sides together to sew, you just gently, gently match up the edges. So, there you go. Uh, so, I'm glad I showed this again because I hadn't showed you how I did the background, and it certainly made it easier and I think a little more interesting. And like I said, I didn't want a busy background because the cow is the star and there's plenty of busy going on with her. I can't even tell you how many pieces I put. So I really like it. And this teacher was Jane Hayworth and she is going to be teaching a class again at the Greenville, South Carolina. Um, Mancuso Quilt Show. I hope she still has an opening. If you would like to take the class from her, this is virtual. You'll be in your own space and you'll be doing a Zoom and learning. And she was a great teacher. And some people got a little wigged out because you are, it's, she made it easy. So instead of cutting out freezer paper and, you know, being so precise, she would just like lay your fabric and then kind of peek under and draw the line, make it free and easy. Well, that is my language. That is what I love doing. And it was wonderful. I'm making this for Katie because I couldn't figure out what color to make the cow. And so I thought of my daughter because she has a little farm. And in fact, wait till I show you photos. One of her sheep gave birth to two ram lambs. So I'm excited. And she's got at least two others that are due to give birth. So I do have a picture of the baby lambs. So anyway, I thought, well, if I made it for Katie, then it just came to me what colors to make it. So. I want to pick an animal and do my own. And, you know, Deborah Donnell gave me good in, um, inspiration. And so did Betty. So I'm very, very excited. So, okay. Now, I'll get into this in just a minute. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah, that goes with that. All right. So I did put in an order. Birdie. You are loud. I did put in an order. Let me try to hold her while I do this because maybe it'll make her quieter when I put her back. Ready? Step up. Good girl. You'll notice with a bird, most birds, when you go to 
pick them up. You say, step up. You do that from the very beginning. And you'll notice they always look like they're going to bite you first. That is an instinct for them. What they're doing in the wild, they want to make sure that the branch they're going to step onto is not rotten, that it will hold them at sturdy. So she doesn't hurt me. All she does is just kind of makes it's and it's something they just do out of instinct. So, hey. So, um, I don't think Katie sells her. Ow, stop it. Now, if you're going to be rude, I'm going to put her back. She is being rude. Go back over there. Oh, she bit my ear. That didn't feel good. And when you know what? When she acts up, she goes back. And I know it's my fault. I haven't been spending enough time with her. But fighting's not allowed. So anyway, um, you said, does she sell wool? She's just now getting into wool sheep. Up until now, she has raised meat sheep because she did it for her two um, children who were in 4-H and the local market. Um, that's what their local market does. But I'll show you that you'll see by the you that she just had two babies from that this is more of a, it's a good combination of a meat animal and a wool, a fleece animal. So, but mostly hers are meat breeds. Now, sometimes she, when she sends um, a lamb off to market, she'll ask for the fleece back and then she'll send it and have it cured. Um, but she does felt art, but she usually buys um, her wool in like, Rolex, um, roving, she buys it usually um, if you get it like already dyed. She's done some dyeing of wool, but she's a talented girl. Amazing. I've got to remember next week I'll bring down. She made me a birthday present a couple years ago, and it's hummingbirds and hollyhocks, and it's hanging upstairs. I'll bring it down for next week. She's so talented. So... I put an order in this week um, from my new favorite, Michelle, my new favorite, Missouri Star. I have so many favorites. Let's be honest. I love pineapple fabrics. I love my local sewingly yours. I love um, Hancock's of Paducah. I love Missouri Star. I, I love little Miss, um, oh gosh, Ash. I better forget, I, I just run into the Midnight Quilter. You know who I'm talking about. So I, I love a lot of people. But I happened to see a fabric line that was gorgeous. Yes, I Miss Michelle is the one that turned me on to Missouri Star. She was like, there's this company. I mean, she was on to them from the very beginning. There's this company. You'd love them. You'd love them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh, Michelle, you weren't exaggerating. So I put an order in for some fabrics. I always look around to see what else I need if you got to pay shipping. And I needed some applique needles. Well, they didn't have appliques the way I wanted. And so I got Milner's. And Milner's are pretty good. Now, straw quilts, a lot of people like to do applique with straw quilts. One of my problems with straw quilts is, ah, Cali Quilt sells a quarter. Ooh, I should check into that because sometimes it bothers me that they make you buy a whole yard of something. But um, straw quilts are very supple and they bend. So I go through those like you wouldn't believe because I got big hands and, you know, I kind of get in there and go. But these were, these were a very good price. They're Richard Hemming and Son, good quality. I was very happy to get these. And it's 16 to a pack, which I like. All right. This is one of the reasons I love Missouri Star Quilt Company. It makes me smile. It takes her... A couple extra minutes, but it makes me smile when I open up the package and there's a nice note. I love it. Oh, no. Is Nadine already leaving? Oh, poo. Um, oh, okay. She's saying hello. 
Nadine, I have to apologize to you. I sent out all the packages that I thought I needed to. And I was so excited. And everybody who won those three quilts plus Diana Wright and Marsha got their packages. Good job, right? The other day I was cleaning off my table and what did I find? I found the package with Nadine's glove in it. Now, if Miss Nadine cuts herself because she doesn't have her glove yet, it's going to be my fault. Miss Nadine, I now have it packaged up. I'm going to take it and ship it out right away. I'm so sorry. I thought I was done. My, I was just kind of like so proud of myself. I got all my packages mailed. Forgot her glove. So it's ready to go. I'll get it in the mail tomorrow. I'm so sorry, sweetheart. So now I had to, I had to apologize. So anyway. This fabric, I saw, you know, it's, they know what they're doing when they say, get on our free newsletter. They know that when they send you your email and you're looking through at the news of the day and all of that, they know that you'll see that little ad on the side and you'll go, oh, I have to have that. Well, that was that. Oh, the time change, daylight savings time. Gosh, we sprung forward. So, and you know what? I don't know what y'all do, Nadine. Yep, we now we switch to summertime hours in March and November. So, but you know what? My one daughter who gets who I get the biggest kick out of, she said, I'm so sick of this daylight savings time. Because she doesn't like things to change. She likes you to decide what you're going to do and stick with it. <laughs> but I want to show you this fabric. It's called Island Batik. And I saw they had the two-inch strips. Would be a jelly roll. But with this fabric, they're kind of laid out in two rows in a packet. I went nuts. Oh, Laura likes light evenings. See, I love those long winter nights. But look at these colors. And it was something about the blender fabrics. You know, I told you about bridge fabrics. Let me show you. So you've got this dark color, and then you've got this pretty teal. Well, what, what joins and makes those colors join together? There it is. See that? So, um, it's got a little bit of teal in it. So, those are the bridge fabrics. Now, here's teal and orange. Well, guess what? And they've got, and here's, look at this. Isn't that gorgeous? Teal, orange, and purple. So, I didn't, I put it in my cart. And then, you know, I think I've got 64 UFOs to finish. I don't need to be buying more fabric. Well, then the next thing I said, you know what? I kept coming back to that fabric and it was just so beautiful. And I looked for other collections and none of them had this purple, orange, and teal and aqua. I mean, who would have thought purple, orange, and aqua? And it got in my head and I just I'd said, I want it. So I went to order it. Guess what? They were all out. And it said, sorry, gone forever. Gone forever. That is the worst thing to hear in the whole world. And so um, I said, well, surely another company carries this. I looked everywhere and could not find it. Ah, so guess what? For the next two weeks, Nadine, we're going to start just a little earlier for you. That would be nice. We'll get to enjoy Nadine. So, but this must have been Island Batiks, the name of the fabric line. Let me show you. Island Batiks, the name of the fabric line. And don't you love how they tie them with cute Cute ribbon. 
This is called Curiosity Batiks. Island Batiks. Yes, other places carry Island Batiks. But guess what? The only place that I found this mix was at Missouri Star Quilts. And now the, the strips, the two and a half inch strips, are gone forever. So the only thing they had left of it was the charm pack. I got three charm packs because <laughs> I'm going to find a way to make this into a quilt because I adore. I mean, these colors are amazing. They're so intense. And then, of course, once you have this, you've got to have a background that does it justice. Look what I got. Because I'm liking the idea now to not do just white or tan or black. And I think this will be gorgeous. I think it'll give your eye a calm place to rest. I think it's going to be fabulous. So, got three yards. I got three of these packs. Luckily, these were on sale for $11 and a few cents. So I got three of these. And then this was on sale for... $5.99 or $6.99. I got three yards of that. And after I told Mark my sob story about I wanted the fabric, but I didn't, I was afraid to buy anything. And now it's sold out. And I said, but they've got these. Well, buy them. You got to love a man who takes charge <laughs> and says, I don't want you to keep whining every night. Just get it. <laughs> So that's my new purchase. And while I was there, you know, because you got it. Luckily, Missouri Star Quilt Company only charges $5 flat shipping. Gotta love that. And let me show you another little thing I found in the clearance because that's what I do. I go to the clearance. Okay. See this? This was from the Row Robin. And that was like in 2018. And I did not participate because I thought I can't keep up a schedule. And this is so musical, so musical. Well, they had this pen on sale for a dollar, come on, dollar 25. And I said, I've got to get this. And the reason I had to get it is because my sons and his wife are professional musicians. So, you know, I like wearing now a name badge and you put what show pins and stuff on it when you go to shows. It might be silly, but for me, it's fun. So I got this because I'll be putting it on my name badge when I go to shows. And it's like I'm taking my son with me when I go. Okay. I need to turn on. Well, now I guess I'm okay. I was wondering if I needed to turn on the light. But because outside's getting very cloudy. In fact, today, Mark went to get some yard fertilizer so we can get the grass to come up good. And it's that time. So here for our grass, we fertilize in March, May, end of May, and September. That's it. So, okay. So now I showed you the new stuff. Let me see. I showed you those three landscapes, because I had to put them on my UFO list. And... I've got a big basket full of the last of the UFOs to show you. Now, when I say the last of the UFOs, I realized I have floppies. Floppy is a top that hasn't been quilted. But you piece the top, so good job. I realized when I was looking at UFOs, wait a minute, I got a bunch of floppies in my closet. And technically, they count. So, I say that we're just about done with the UFOs. But I think next week we will do, I had to turn off the fan. It's getting right warm in here. So, I mean, the heater. I have a little heater down here. The floor stays cold because it's a walkout basement. But the air was getting too hot. So anyway, so I will be showing you some, um, I will be showing you some of my floppies that are hanging in the closet. All right, so the rest of the day, 
I want to show you photos. I did a really good job of scouring the site and trying to get some new pictures and deleting some of the ones you've already seen. I also, someone asked me last week, now I have forgotten, um, but I have a quilt to show you, which I'll get ready to show you right now. And then I have the rest of the UFOs. And I'm so proud of myself. I put away last week's UFOs because I'm determined to keep this room clean. <laughs> so, all right. Y'all were asking. I told you about doing 3D butterflies. This quilt is a little dusty, so if I sneeze, it's okay. This is a quilt I made probably back in 2016. The first one I made, I gave to my daughter-in-law. Because it had a hush, it had a purple, Maisie, had a purple background. And purple is her signature color, so I gave that to her. So then I made a new one for myself, because blue is my favorite color. And I'll show you the back because this has a lot of embellishment and a lot of thread painting. But I wanted to show you, Maisie, I wanted to show you that you only do the quilting last. And that's just to fill in the blank spaces. Okay. So this is a fun quilt. And some of you are going to say, oh, I've seen that one before. But now I want to turn on my lamp. Hold on just a second. Mark must be out working on the driveway because Maisie thinks now she's got to protect us from the big bad monster. All right. This, I took a class from Marjan Kukful or Marjan, and she's from Denmark. She's lived in California for years and very, very talented, very talented woman. So I took this class and I was just in 2014 or 2015, I was just enthralled with her use of three dimension. And that's the first time I'd really seen that and I fell in love with it. So what I did is made double-sided petals so that they could be away from the quilt and have some heft to them. Then I took and I used, see how the leaves are different colors? Well, I did that, number one, with different shades of fabric, but number two, with ink tints, and even some oil pastels to give shading to the leaves. Then the sunflower heads, I used minky fabric. I used beading, thread painting, and decorative yarns to give the look. Okay, so I'm real tickled with this. I really love it. And finding, oh, and like, this is, this is decorator's um, trim. And I thought that looks pretty cool there too. So it, be thinking about decorator fabrics. Now, I'd like to say, that there, there's a formula for, I'll show you, for how to do a sunflower face. And it's called the Fri Fibonacci, something like that. It's Italian. It's a man who does, who realized, yes, Maisie is on patrol, how to do, the, there is a mathematical formula to the way sunflower seeds. Fire, oh. Oh, well, I'll, I'll have to figure it out later. But I tried to learn to do that for the sowing of my sunflowers. It was too much for Deb. I'm sorry, math is not my forte. But the reason I'm showing you this is because something that is my forte, see the butterflies on there? I made them myself. I used sulky, oh wait, no, what is the name of it? Hold on. And somebody said, can you show us how to do the butterflies? Solvy. 
Okay. It's Solvy Water Soluble Stabilizer. And you put it in a hoop, an embroidery hoop. And then you proceed, and it feels like a thin vinyl. There it is, right there. Luckily, I bought this from a woman who was scaling down her accus acquisitions. And I got it for just a couple dollars because it's not the cheapest. But anyway, Solvy Water Soluble Stabilizer. It, it looks and feels like a lightweight vinyl. Make sure, though, don't drink your water near it. Don't spill your water near it. I keep it in a plastic bag because humidity... Um, accidental water spill would ruin the whole roll. So, okay. So here's one of the butterflies. There's three on here. Let me find them all. Here is another butterfly. And here is the final butterfly. And one thing I did is I only partially washed out the salvi. You put it in a bowl of warm, lukewarm water, and it starts dissolving right away. But I don't, you kind of scrub it to get it to dissolve. I only take up some of it, maybe half of it away. Then I take it out of the water when I feel like I've washed about half away, take it out of the water and put it immediately on a towel or paper towel and pat it dry. And the reason I do this is it makes it stiff. And then what I do when it's still when it's still a little damp is I will bend it, fold it like this one. You can see I, I folded it and let it dry in the shape you want it to end up being. Then it will keep that shape. So remember that. Use water-soluble stabilizer. And only take out half. You know, only wash it a little bit. When you start to feel it get a little thin, stop. Take it out of the water. Put it on a towel and just pat. Do not rub. Just pat it, pat it, pat it. And then when you feel like you've got it pretty dry, then, whoops, I do need this back on. Then when you feel like you've got it pretty dry, then take it, pick it up carefully Shape it and then lay it on something so like an upside down cup or something so it'll hold that shape. And then let it dry the rest of the way. And then you've got a 3D butterfly. And it's only made with thread. So wouldn't those butterflies be cool? So now let me show you how I do this. Last night I drew it. Okay, hopefully everybody can still hear me and see me. I haven't messed up anything. All right, so here is a butterfly I'm working on right now. And I know that this looks yellow, but really this is lime green. And what I've done is you have to use either a dry erase marker or a Sharpie marker. It has to be a permanent marker. You're very welcome. And you have to use a permanent marker. The reason to use a permanent marker is because if you used like a Crayola marker, they're water-based, you would totally melt, you would totally melt the solvy. Okay? Because let me see this little dot right there that's a water drop hit it and look at that so um so anyway then today i was working on this and sometimes i would kind of concentrate in one tight space and it kind of sucked the thread down into the um feed dogs so you know what i did i took scraps of solvy do you see right here where there are scraps on the back. So if the salvy started to tear, 
I cut out a scrap piece and I took and licked around the edge of it and stuck it on the other. And that way I, I have it built up a thicker layer because I noticed that the solvy today's a humid day and it just wanted to tear easily. So I suggest when you go to do this, I know solvy is not cheap, but do two layers and then keep some scraps handy so that, because like this tore all the way down the middle. Well, all I did is then put a piece of scrap solvy underneath and I just used my finger and, and, and my own spit and I got it to stick. Or if you have a glass of water, just don't make it too wet. All right, so now what I started with was my pretty lime green, and it's a beautiful lime green. I know with the light, it makes it look yellow, but this is the color, and I'll show you in a minute the butterfly that I'm doing, and so I did all of my lime greens first. Now, some of this, you'll see that there's little stitches that I don't want there, but they're there for now. Do you know why? Oh, thank you. I always hope to inspire you, sweetheart. Oh, I'm so, that was such, it was so sweet when you wrote me that note that I've never had somebody so excited to get something. Thank you. So now, do you notice what I've done in here? I have done a zigzag. Okay, first I did a zigzag border to outline the butterfly. Okay. And then I came back and I did a zigzag and I made sure, I made sure to touch the border. I made sure to touch everywhere. Everything is interconnected. I went back and did some fill in to make sure that it's all connected. Because if it's not connected, it will fall apart. So you'll notice that my zigzags, I made sure they touched into the green and then they touched each other and then they touched all the way over to this side. All right. So now what I'm doing is I'm doing a straight stitch. I've dropped my feed dogs and I'm going to do a straight stitch because I want to get some smoothness. And you'll put a lot of thread on this, but just so you know, don't you don't feel like you have to use any expensive thread just use what you can use old thread that you thought was too old to be good enough for any other project because what i'm going to do whoops every once in a while you'll feel it get caught so i'll just cut the thread and oops let me cut it again because i have the feed dogs down and i'm going back and forth and sometimes it'll get a little hung up under there and you'll see here, well, you can't see it yet, but I'll show you in just a minute. But I make sure I go to the center body and do straight stitching across and back. And I just go back and forth going from one side and making sure I touch the other side. Because you want this to be well connected. If you didn't make a, it's what I'm doing kind of. When I did the zigzag, I made a web for this to sit on. And if I didn't do that, then when the salvi was dissolved, it would fall apart. Okay, I just heard it get hung up again. So I'll cut it and move it. Now, it did break the thread this time. So let me re-thread it. But I'm going to show you a little bit of this. And then I'll show you how I put a shimmer on the top of it. This is a great time when you make these butterflies. It's a great time to use your Angelina fibers. So somewhere I've got different color Angelina fibers. But when I looked real quick today, I couldn't find them. But here I, I can only find this, this translucent pearly Angelina. It's called Crystallina. But I can, I'll show you how I can add a little bit of this. All right, let me make sure that my thread has come through. Okay, all right, I wanna make sure that I don't, I'm not having any thread problems. What I'm going to do is take this Angelina thread and scrunch it 
up a little bit and lay it here and then come back and start doing the straight stitching again. And this is a great way of getting iridescence. Okay, when you feel the thread or hear the thread get hung up, just stop it for a moment. All right, now what I'm going to do is this, I want this to have a little shimmer. So I'm going to change the top thread. Now my bottom thread is just a gray, normal weight, like Coach and Clark kind of thread but this is really cool this is a sulky thread that I got from I think that same woman who was trying to downsize and I love it if you ever hear about somebody selling threads let me know because I don't mean a store sale I mean going out of business or downsizing sale because it is wonderful when you get these sometimes people are just wanting to give them away and that's wonderful. Okay, so now I've threaded this metallic. And I'm just going to take it kind of steady because metallic threads can be touchy. But I want you to see what this is going to end up doing. You know what? I'm not sure it's actually sewing. Let me make sure that I think my bobbin may have um, run out. Yep. It's all fun and games until the bobbin runs out. So let me get this on here. Okay. All right. Here we go. Now let's try it. Now I think you'll get a good chance to see what it's like. Whoops. Here's, nope, the, the, the needle became unthreaded. All right. Yay. Okay, here we go. Let's try this again. Whoops. It broke already. Well, I might not be able to show you this. I wanted to show you some of the fun part, but I, like I said, metallic threads are a pistol. All right, let me turn down. When it breaks like that, I'm gonna turn down the tension and see if it'll work better this way. And if the metallic thread continues to be so delicate, I might not be able to sew backwards. I might have to do all my lines in one direction. Whoops. Did it break? Yep, it broke again. All right, so let me pull this out so I can kind of show you. Whoops. Yep. Take off that foot is probably the best thing. Getting the hoop out from under is probably one of the hardest things to do. That thread didn't break. Oh my goodness. Oh well. But let me back this up. Okay. Are you still there? I'm hoping I didn't lose anybody. But do you see now the metallic thread? I had to put down a base of black first. But then the metallic thread looks amazing in the light. So, but this is how I do it. And I had hoped to have more done, but it has been, like I say, it's, we had the windows open late we, the past couple of days. And I think the house is a little humid. And I think it was causing the salt, the salvi 
to really act up. Now let me see if I can get it to shimmer. See that shimmer? Which is really good for butterflies because they do have an iridescence. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to show you the photo that this is supposed to be. So let me carefully turn the camera again and show you what I'm using because the joy and the art of the internet really helps. So let me bring up this photo and you'll see what I'm trying to copy. Y'all are still there, right? <laughs> Whoops. Why is this not? Okay, here we go. This is the butterfly that I'm trying to copy. Okay. So this is the butterfly I'm trying to do. And I just drew it on, looked at it. I'm, and see, I'm, I'm put it laying down black. And then I'll come over it with the lime green and the metallics to get that little iridescence that it looks like but it's so easy to do this you just draw it on then you just carefully sew the thread where it needs to be and then when next week i'll tell you what i'll do i'm going to have it finished and i'll show you how to cut it out and how to put it in the sulky in the water and then we'll finish looking, seeing exactly how you, how you make this. But that's, that's who I'm working on when I'm doing this. So, okay, well, while we're here, let's look at some photos that you sent in because they are the most fun. I'm just going to check back and make sure y'all, everybody's still there? Yeah, I think y'all are still there. All right, now let's go look at your photos because I love seeing your photos. Okay. Well, first, now B did a photo on the site and I don't have it. So I'm hoping, no, I'm hoping that I can try to find it or ask her to send it directly to me. All right, is Miss Betty here? Miss Betty asked for any questions little helps or advice on some of her landscapes and I think that she is doing a great job now I see what she's doing here she's trying to do a nighttime scene with owls on a branch I love the fact that she left some blues in some lighter colors because the moon would shine on everything it touches now, one thing I would do, if it were me, is I. this is where ink tents or crayons or colored pencils come in. Whatever kind of, of coloring she can do on it, where it's, leave it light where the moon rays would touch, where the reflection of the moon would touch, leave it light. Then come over on this side and one half of that branch, color over it dark. Even here, make it real dark all the way down this side and just leave it light just where the reflected light of the moon would hit it. Same thing with the owls. Darken these owls up down here, here. You know, because picture, if that moon's reflecting this way, what would it hit? Tops of the heads, I would cut away right here. I would cut that away and just leave the outline of the owls and then leave the just the tops of their heads showing light, but then start coloring in and get darker and darker as you get to the bottom because you would only be able to see what is reflecting at night. So wherever the light the reflected light of the moon doesn't touch. Now down here, I would say the owls are blocking this part of the tree. So I would darken this, darken everything that's under the owls. Leave the top of this light, 
but come in here halfway down at least and darken all of this. Okay? And you just have to try to picture, draw a line, you know, picture a line coming off the moon. What does it touch first? Leave that light, but like from, from here down, darken those owls up, darken the, the branches, and then you're going to end up with an amazing landscape because your moon, the bat, the nighttime clouds are gorgeous. I think it's cool that you thought to do this. It's awesome. Now, here is her mountain meadow, and she's doing a really good job. Um, she had some of the same problems with that I did with having the lake looking like it's floating a wee bit. I think I would then come in here with some, do more covering up of parts of the lake. Like maybe, maybe decide which end, is it this end or this end, that you're going to kind of cut a piece of plant life to cover it up. Because between you, if you were standing right here, there's a big distance between you and that lake. And there's bound to be things growing between here and there. And that will really help to keep it from floating. I love the fabric she uses. I love how it reflects the mountains. I think that is great. She might want to bring out a little bit more of the snow on the mountain. Um, I think her cabin is great. The tree is great. I think I would bring a little bit more of a root system, you know, put some tree color like coming down this way and coming down that way. Um, I loved all the cuts she made in the grass to make the land look undulating. And I think you are ready when we start adding the flowers and things. And you did a fantastic, you did a better job than I did of showing this hillside. So way to go. I love the mountains. Great work. Great, great work. Okay. Oops. Never mind. She already did add. She added some more plant life. That is wonderful. I think I would maybe come back in here and do a na very narrow dark edge. And um, she can even do that with a crayon or a colored pencil. But yeah, she already took care of all that. So that's wonderful. She even put more roots on the tree. So that's looking fabulous. I love the way she did the light plant in front, the light tree material in front of the cabin to make it pop. So I would say it's looking wonderful. I love her Angelina fibers on the lake to give a little bit of shine. So she's well on her way. Now we'll be ready to start this week on um to start this week on our thread painting okay make sure you have all the fabric sewn down with invisible thread i asked her how did you get these leaves so good with this wolf that's in the woods she said she cut them out of the fabric and they look wonderful that is a great idea that i hadn't thought about and so it really makes it so realistic so i do like that very very much so thank you, Miss Betty, for sharing that with us. Now, Miss Bonnie, let's see what Miss Bonnie is doing. Miss Bonnie only did one block this week. She says she's spending too much time looking at her brand new grandbaby or grand niece. Come on. Whoops, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay, here we go. So this is a farmer's wife block that she's working on. Beautiful, beautiful. Looks like marble. I love that. She used her fabrics to great advantage. All right. So now let me bring this down. And let's go to the next. Oh, look at this 15 bean soup she made. It looks wonderful. So I think she said somebody had saved her a ham bone, something like that, that she put in with it. And we've got another soup to show you. Boy, I would love to have some soup today. And here's this beautiful great niece, great grand niece, something like that. But isn't that the cutest baby? 
so I can see her spending all her time thinking about that little baby. All right, so now let's see who else we have. Mine, oh, I got probably, I don't think I've cleaned up my folder good enough, but let's see what we've got. All right, this is when I was starting the cow, and I told you how that, um, I started doing it literally with purple and forms of yellow fabric, and it just didn't look right. And so I asked the teacher, Jane, she's an amazing teacher, and she agreed, bring in some bridge fabrics. And a bridge fabric for me is something that connects the purple to the yellow. What's in between that that'll help hold those together? And I immediately like the ear better. And here's how I started. And I told you, I said, it won't be done for quite a bit. And that is true, because I would come back and redo this and redo that and update this. Well, here's my little Maisie. She loves to snuggle. Makes it hard for me to get my handwork done, but she loves to snuggle. And here she is again. But she is now very happy living here with Mark and I, and I couldn't be happier for her and with her. She's a darling little doggie. Here is my cow progress and I've changed a lot on it because as you you know add one thing this is my daughter's new puppy and he was a rescue and he's just as cute as can be he's 10 weeks old and weighs over 16 pounds so he is going to be a big big dog oh and then yesterday I noticed Maisie wasn't in the bed with me what had she done she came out and snuggled with, with dad. So Mark got, uh, he won her over. And ha look at that. Isn't that sweet? This is my oldest daughter with her vaccination card. And she's a teacher, so she was able to be vaccinated. Here's the picture that I didn't even know I had. And when I looked at this, and, and you notice one good thing they did is they keep the top of the lake pretty flat and then have the undulation on the bottom. And I saw the stone wall and went, that's what my picture needs. So I'm real tickled. I think that is just beautiful. And thank goodness I had that somewhere. And what a great inspiration it gave. All right. Now let's see what else we have. Uh, more cow, cow, cow. Oops. Did I go back to the beginning? I think I did. I might have been at the end then. Oh, here is, here is the butterfly, like I told you, that I'm using as my inspiration. Then my daughter paints um, henna designs on her hand. And I just find it amazing. Then the other day we had 70 degree temps, so she took her Wonder Dog Polly and they went to walk around the lake. And here is the henna after it's been washed off and ages. Looks really pretty. This is my grandson Evan with Miss Polly. This is my grandson Devin up in Maryland running a race at his school. Thank goodness they're able to now start doing a little bit more. This is my middle child, my second daughter, Katie, with that puppy. And the, they named him Henry, which I think is such a cute name for him. And this is the new lambs, two ram lambs. And you kind of hate, in a way, to have ram lambs because all they can do is go to the meat market. But you see, the mother's got a pretty good fleece on her. And it would have been nice if she could have... Gosh, I've forgotten the name of this breed. It's the breed from the movie Babe, the pig movie Babe, and they're so cute. There's something like a Lester Border Cross, and they're two her two ram lambs. And she's got two other lambs. That's Henry again about two weeks ago. And look at Henry. He's already figured out if you jump on the couch, you can look out the window and see the good stuff going on. So those are my photos this week.
And Deborah Dunnell, Deborah, I kept your kitty because your kitty was such great inspiration for me. So we're thinking of you, sweetie, and can't wait when you can get back to creating again. So thank you, Miss Deborah. Let's see who else we have. Dolores. Whoops. Where did Dolores? Oops. Hold on. Where did? Oh, no. I have accidentally lost Dolores. So let me type it in. Sometimes when I click funny, I lose stuff. Okay, here it goes. Let's find Dolores. Yep, I put her inside Linda's folder. Okay, so I love her little Carolina Wren. And she did her confetti background. How cute is that? I love that. Beautiful work. And then, let me see. I've got to get this picture smaller so I can move to the next one. This, I told her I gave her my highest compliment. When I first opened it, I opened it so big, I forgot that it was a picture of a raccoon. I opened it so big that I saw him close up. It scared the bejeebus out of me. And I closed it back real fast. And then I realized, oh, that's right. She said she did a raccoon quilt. So I opened it again and opened it bigger. And what a cute quilt this is. But I said, I gave you my highest compliment. That was so realistic that I closed that thing so fast. <laughs> and then felt silly. But anyway, it was very realistic. And then here is her landscape quilt. I love it. I love the, the way she did the mountains and her cabin and her lake looks so well placed and it not flying or floating like mine was at all. So beautiful, beautiful job. And I love that she captured the undulations in the land, undulations in the land. So I can't wait to see what, when we start doing our thread painting and then our hand embroidery. So way to go, Miss Dolores. Now, I need to bring this out and put it back because I definitely lost it. Whoops, come on. Oh, well, help me remember <laughs> that it's in. Yeah, but it's still not out, so I will have to get it out of Linda's. All right, Chanel, Diana Wright, let's see what we've got. She has been busy again, let me tell you. She's busy. Her husband's busy. They're putting in a patio and a fire pit, which should be wonderful. And so here, I forget what, I think this is the small Edita Sitar village, Winter Village. And of course, being our amazing Diana, she did one small village and one large village. And now she's got to get ready and do the... Um, applique on both of them. And I have a feeling that's not her favorite part. This is the cutest little quilt she made with penguins on it. I mean, how cute is that? Way to go, Miss Diana. Uh, she really does beautiful work. Here is the patio that her husband is putting down. Look at that beautiful thing. And if I know Miss Diana, she's probably been out there right with him doing it. Okay. Then here is, come on. This must be the little one. How cute. She's got the borders on. And now she'll start the applique. Or maybe not. All right. I'll bring this down. Okay. Come over here. Oh, look at this. Fire pit area, and they're really doing a great job getting the edging in, putting the crushed stone base or sand base, and they use the laser level to make sure it's nice and level. It'll drain well, and I think I saw them put drain pipes around it, so it's not going to become a mess when they get those strong frog strangler range that they do in Texas. And look, here's all that stone. I think it's colored concrete blocks 
that they have ready to go in. Hard-working people, I'll tell you that. But how nice is that going to be? Sit out on a quiet Texas evening and around a fire. That'll be nice. Here's her larger Edita Sitar Winter Village. Beautiful, Diana. Another view of the wonderful fire pit. Whoops, I went past too fast. Look at that. They just really putting it together. Here is a quilt she just finished, and it's an Edita Sitar, and it's something with a star, uh, a snowflake pattern. Snowflake star, something like that. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's see where we're going now. Yep, there's the back of it. I love it. She always shows us the back. And she put her John Wayne quilt back on the frame. It's such a complex quilt. But look at that beautiful fabric. Isn't that gorgeous? All right. Thank you, Miss Diana. Those are a lot of wonderful photos. Okay, and now we'll go to Inger, and Inger went out for a walk and got out in the beautiful wilderness of Norway, and in this picture, it might be hard for you to see, but there's a creek right there, and there's her faithful, beautiful dog, a brown dog right there, and she got out for a walk in the woods to clear her mind, and that's beautiful, and boy, doesn't, doesn't that just make you feel calm and more alive and oh it's just wonderful i don't have any new ones of miss jamie but i love any chance to get to see crystal so here is miss crystal and their wonderful saint patrick's day decor and in fact that's coming up this week and i found out i was real happy to, to, to know that when they put the dye in the Chicago River, it's a vegetable dye. It's a yellow dye that turns green when it hits the water. So that's good to know. Nothing that will hurt the river. So, because those are little things I tend to think about, you know? <laughs> so I do. And Miss Jody and her Frankenstein and Bride. I mean, amazing. It's so beautiful. So, so beautiful. Way to go. That is, I mean, that is just amazing. That is just amazing. Whoops. Sorry, I didn't mean to close it out that fast. My finger. Have you noticed as you get older, your fingers sometimes jiggle around a little bit? Here's Dolores' folder. Let me see if it'll let me move it. It did. Okay. So look at these wonderful things. I think they're done out of polymer clay. And Miss Linda McCullough makes them. And they're just, she's just so talented. And she's like me. We love all form of media when we make these things. And it's just beautiful. That's a piece of jewelry. And look at the gold leaf she's got down under that finish. And then look at these cutie pie. Look at these cutie pie little ornament, fridge ornaments. I love them. So she keeps, I love how she keeps herself busy. That is just, and, and creative. I mean, it's a good day when you can create. And Marsha, I forgot that Marsha had sent me two crocheted items. Here is a little bag with a beautiful green lace, uh, green yarn, pardon me. And then here is her yellow yarn. So way to go, Miss Marcia. Nice to know you're creating too. Because you know what? That makes everything better. All right. Miss Nadine. All I've got from Miss Nadine, Nadine this week is a wonderful soup that she made. And she is such a talented photographer. She could take dog food and make it look like a piece of art. But that soup does look wonderful. And I love the candle and the beautiful wood table. Very talented photographer and good cook, Miss Nadine. Thank you for sending that, sweetie. Let's see. Patricia, 
I wanted to make sure to remind you. Oh, no, I missed a picture of Patricia's. It had her granddaughter who was painting her nails. But this is her St. Patrick's Day door welcome and her tablescape. And look at this cute. I figured so in honor of Kiwi being down here, this is a quilter's parrot. And I'm sure Kiwi would say the same thing, especially this morning when I was trying to work on that butterfly and it ripped. Then here's quilt counseling. So darn cute. And how many of us, when we go to show our beautiful quilts, point out every mistake we have made in the entire quilt? I know I do. I'm terrible at that. And nobody would notice if we didn't point them out. <laughs> And I'm sorry I missed a picture of Jenny, Miss Pat. They're driving back today from Maryland. So I'm sorry. I tried putting it in, and I don't know why, but I was having a hard time getting it to put to download. Here's Miss Polly's work where she was rightfully upset that she could see the polymer thread needle holes in her work. And... You know, I totally understand, but sometimes that's just the way it is. But she, you know, she can try to wet her finger a little better and rub on there, although with the ink tips, she has to be careful. Um, she can try to go on the back and run her fingernail across the stitching and hope the holes fill in a little bit. She can try to use a smaller needle, but that's part, I, I have that happen every time I use invisible thread. It's very pretty. I love her ink tense work. Okay. Now let's see. We're almost done with these. Um, oh, our Susie. Love our Susie. And I hope she's going to finish her landscapes and she's not going to let them overwhelm her because she's a beautiful spirit and has great promise with her quilting. So I'm really impressed. And here is a picture of Susie and her beautiful daughter. Aren't they wonderful? Now I see the spirit in her face and her daughter's face. That's our Miss Susie. Cute as a button. Love her. All right, everybody. So I'm looking at the time and realizing I talk way too much this time because I haven't even shown you my UFOs. I might have to wait for those for next week, but hopefully you're not going anywhere and you'll be back to see because I've got huge, huge basket. And part of my UFOs are two Jenny Buyer blocks of the month that I need to finish. So, because you know, I love my Jenny Buyer. Let me come back to you. Make sure you're still here. And you can still see me. I love your show and tells. Please keep those photos coming. I love them. So, and by next week, I will have the, see, I even brought down, I brought down the bowl to have, put the warm water in to show you how to take and get rid of most of the salvy of the butterfly. But I just couldn't get it done in time. And that's one of those things that if you have you ever noticed when you try to sew and you're in a big hurry everything goes kaflooey so don't don't let things go kaflooey <laughs> there are some things you can't rush all right um in finishing up on here and finishing up on here i wanted to tell you something real quickly about taking classes we'll finish with this today if you take a class, okay, whether it's virtual or in person, let the teacher teach it her way, okay? Let me see if I can get, come here. I'll see if she'll not bite me now. That would be very nice. Hello. Okay, let the teacher teach the class her way. Don't try to tell her a better way. Don't try telling people around you, well, there's a better way to do this. It's her class. Then, if you wish to do it another way, do it quietly without telling anyone. You don't have to keep 
uh, you don't have to do it her way, but don't interfere with her teaching it that way. It'll confuse more people than you know. Don't criticize the quilt that she made or the quilt that she designed for you to make. Or, and don't criticize her methods during class. You may be, even if you're virtual and you're at home, if they can hear you, remember your manners. Because it, it's just really, I've taught before, and it's hard when somebody says, well, you should do it this way, or I do it this way, this is better. Or this is a dumb quilt design, or this is a dumb way to do a quilt. Excuse me? That can ruin the whole class's atmosphere. Also, let the teacher explain fully her information before you ask questions or interrupt her. We sometimes forget, you know, we think, oh, I want to ask this right away. Well, let her get through her presentation because she has to give you a, a, a rundown of what you'll be doing and what the quilt and your first methods. And then after she finishes that, then you can ask questions. And then you can interrupt. Um, but let her, let her get her. When you're a teacher and you're going in to teach a class, you get your mindset and you know what you need to say. And when people interrupt too much, it throws you all off. All right. If you didn't plan ahead for a class, don't sit and complain during the class. Because if you didn't, if you waited till the last minute to print out the stuff you needed for the class, or you just didn't get your supplies and your fabrics ready, then don't sit there and complain. Don't say a word about it. Because it can really put a damper on the whole class. And I'm sorry for your lack of planning, but that's not anybody else's problems. It's your own. It's your own. So don't come in and whine and complain. You made that choice. All right. I'm sorry if I'm seeming tough, but I've experienced this a lot in classes. Then don't talk about other products than the ones the teacher's using or recommending. You might have a product that you adore, but that's not, this is not your class. If you want to talk about your product, then you teach class. But let the teacher teach it her way. Okay, and I'm not trying to be too hard on you, but it are things that really can get a class off track. And you paid for that class. You don't want somebody getting it off track. All right, don't criticize the organization that's sponsoring the class. It puts the teacher in a terrible position. You don't want her to have to say something just to agree with you and or have her pull away because you're bad-mouthing the organization that's putting on the class to begin with. Without that organization, you wouldn't have been sitting in that class. So be careful. Then be quiet and attentive for the first half hour or so of the class so that everyone can hear instructions. Do not leave. Get up. Do not chat with your neighbor. Pay attention. If you want, take notes. But just listen quietly because that way everyone can hear. People like me, I have a hearing loss. When you sit there and interrupt or you sit there and start gabbing to your neighbor, I can't hear what the teacher is trying to teach me. Then, number one, thank that teacher because she put a lot of time and effort into it. And she's not really getting paid all that much. Thank her for her time and effort. Whether you think she did it just the way you would do it or not, doesn't matter. She, put the, she did the best job she could. I also find when I go out of town and take classes, I'll take a little homemade pin cushion, something like that, that I give to the teacher to show my appreciation. It goes a long way in letting a teacher know you value what they do. So that was it. I'll end with that and kind of hoping that, you know, you know, sometimes we forget ourselves, and especially if we're uh, doing a virtual class and we're in the comfort of our home, but you still are a part of a class and use your best manners. Use your best manners. Sometimes as we age, we get a little pushy. <laughs>
<laughs> so, all right. Well, I just thought I'd share that with you today. And thank you so much for spending another Sunday with me. Next week, we're going to get to the fun part, cutting out the butterfly and putting it in salvi and watching. That's so much fun. And I want you to be there for all of it. So, and then we've got this basket full, full of UFOs, and maybe I'll pull some floppies out of the closet too. Well, I can tell that little Miss Kiwi wants my full attention, so I guess I better go, or she's going to pluck me bald. So y'all take good care. Have a great week. I hope it's warming up where you are. Get your vaccination. We're hoping that ours are going to be opened up by the 15th. So cross the finger, as soon as I can get my vaccination, I'm going to be there. That's the only way this country can open back up if everybody does their patriotic duty and gets the vaccination. All right, everybody, take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Exactly, Nadine. I agree. And so don't forget, Nadine, you can come in an hour early next week. We have more time with our Nadine because we love her to bits. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for staying the whole long time, and I appreciate it. Take good care. Take good care of yourself and get that vaccination, okay? Bye-bye, everybody. Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>